Prince Harry gets candid about fatherhood, family, and his meeting with the Queen. Oh, it was great. It was, it was just so nice to see her. Prince George and Princess Charlotte make their Easter debut as Harry and Meghan kick off the Invictus Games with a kiss. He's the founder of the Invictus Games and the father to our two little ones, Archie and Lily. Please welcome my incredible husband, Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex. Plus, Queen Elizabeth celebrates her 96th birthday, and royal author Bethan Holt helps us look back at some of her most iconic fashion moments. We've got that plus so much more in today's Royally Us. Hello to our fellow royal lovers and welcome to Royally Us. I'm Christina, that's Christine. And yes, it is a huge week of royal. <laughs> <laughs> Lots to get through today. So much, so many diverse stories, I think. So a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. And of course, last week's show got you guys talking. So Lisa Bradford says, I doubt seriously that Harry and Meghan would ever want to work part-time or any time on behalf of the royal family. If that was the case, they never would have left the first place. Too much water under the bridge to return. Now, this was um, taken from our interview with Tom Quinn last week, where he said that he heard that Prince Charles, since he wants to slim down the, the monarchy, may be open to the fact of Prince Harry and Meghan being part-time royals, which is kind of what they wanted from the beginning. Yeah, it was interesting. You know, we, we've sort of been told that the Queen didn't want, you know, a half in, half out situation, mm-hmm. either they were in or out. And I think the problem that they might find is that if they did, you know, kind of have a part-time role, they would still have to stick to a lot of royal rules, which it mm-hmm. seems like they don't really um, like working within those parameters. So I'll be really interested if they do rejoin the royal fold. Mm, definitely. All right. Mark Fru says, whether Charles likes it or not, he will have to listen to the people. And I don't see the people forgiving Harry and Meghan anytime soon. That's why I can't see Charles allowing them to be part-time royals i think it's wishful thinking at best possibly i don't know i mean we'll have to wait and see i mean it doesn't seem like harry and uh charles have the best relationship to begin with so i don't know i don't know if either side really wants this it's really interesting you know the royal family as much as we talk internationally and especially you know in america they really do serve the british people and i don't think the british people are very fond of harry and Meghan after everything that's unraveled so i don't know that they're really the you know i think that the british people might not feel that they're the best representatives of their country so that's a very interesting point it is and then finally ak says kate carried louise to stroke a horse when william was playing polo at the polo match where she and megan did not speak a word while sitting under a tree and everyone was watching their interaction or lack thereof that was right <laughs> after archie's birth but kate is definitely not allergic nor afraid of them it was nice to see louis so taken up with the horses case closed thank you ak <laughs> yes i think i was saying i was like i feel like there was some time we saw her with horses so thank you for remembering when you yes. did not <laughs> <laughs> all right all right let's get to our royal roundup and kick it off with Prince Harry's candid interview with Hoda Kotb, where he talked about fatherhood, his mission to serve, and whether or not he misses his family. Take a look. But do you miss your brother, your dad? Look, I mean, I'm for me, at the moment, I'm here yeah. focused on these guys yeah. and these families and giving everything I can, 120% to them, mm-hmm. to make sure that they have the experience of a lifetime. Yeah. That's my focus here. And then when I leave here, I get back and my focus is my family, who I miss massively. You do, I <laughs> yeah. bet. Definitely interesting that he seemingly dodged the question about Prince William and Prince Charles, but he did talk about he and Meghan's mission to continue to serve despite no longer being working members of the royal family. He said, the two of us, you know, this is the life that she signed up for and that we were committed to doing as a couple forever. Because of the circumstances, we've now moved that life of service to the States, but nothing's changed for us. It's just a little bit more complicated to have to restart. Now, of course, he also talked about that surprise meeting with Queen Elizabeth. And here's what he had to say about it. Uh, it was great. It was, it was just so nice to see her. You know, she's on, she's on great form. We always, she's always got a great sense of humor uh, with me. And I'm just making sure that she's, you know, protected and got the, the right people around Well, you, you make her laugh. That's what she always says. Uh, I, did you do it again? <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, I did. Uh, both <laughs> Megan and I had tea with her. So it was, it was really nice to catch up with her. I mean, this was a huge, a, a huge deal. Yeah, I mean, this was something that we always, you know, we've been going back and forth. Will they ever come back? Will they ever see the queen again? I think it was so important that Harry um, did get to see his grandmother again and spend some time with her. And maybe they did work through or talk through some issues. Um, I imagine it was quite a formal Mm -hmm. meeting. You know, I don't think it was as casual or comfortable as, you know, 
some, you know, a normal person visiting their grandmother for sure. Um, but I am so glad that they got together and, you know, we'll see what, what comes from, from this, you know, definitely. Hopefully, hopefully this is a step in the right direction, uh, a step into healing and things like that. But to break this meeting down even further about maybe who played peacemaker, um, why they didn't see Prince William, um, to help us do that is Royal expert, Jonathan Sacerdoti. So take a look at this. There was a huge, huge story that happened this week. Prince Harry had a secret meeting with the queen along with Meghan. The first time that she has been back in the UK since they left the royal family. So was this a totally impromptu meeting or was this planned for uh, for a little while? Well, it's hard to know. Certainly, I don't think it's an easy thing for the Queen to arrange meetings at all at the moment, maybe even with family. And since she was ill with COVID and before that was taken into hospital last October, we've seen a lot less of her. And I think that just at her age and in her condition, it takes some planning for her to be able to um, come up with meetings and meet people. Now, that might be a bit less the case for private meetings like this one with family members. Uh, but certainly, it will at least have involved some planning because even in her condition, the Queen still has quite a busy schedule. So I would say that there was probably some planning uh, and maybe they wanted to keep it quiet even if it was planned ahead in advance because perhaps both sides thought it was better not to have too much glare of the media on, on this kind of meeting. Mm -hmm, definitely. And, you know, Prince William was not in attendance. We had reporting that he was um, on a ski vacation. Um, do you know any more about that? And, you know, uh, you know, we heard that they're probably trying to get back on better terms. Maybe that if he does come to... Um, the Queen's Platinum Jubilee in June, maybe they will finally get together, who knows? I think it must be very difficult for Prince William and generally for the royal family because there is that urge, presumably, for them to meet up, to reconcile or, or to start at least to make some kind of peace between them, even if they're not going to be as close as they might once have been. Uh, but that's got to be tempered by the considerations they will have in their minds all the time of the damage that can be done because Let's not put too fine a point on it. Meghan and Harry are constantly doing damage to the royal family, and it seems intentional. If it's not intentional, it's then a reflection on their recklessness and perhaps lack of intelligence in how they deal with these things. So either way, whether it's deliberate or not deliberate, they are doing this damage, and the royal family are in the business of damage limitation for their reputation. So they will want to make sure that if there is a meeting lined up, it's going not to be leaked to the press. What's said needs to be thought about very carefully in case it is leaked. Mm -hmm. And I think that applies for Prince William very much. And that must hurt a lot for a brother who was once very close to Prince Harry. I think it must be very difficult on a personal level to feel that you want to make some sort of peace yet you're worried about how you can do it, whether every overture you make will be reported, twisted, leaked, talked about in a way that isn't really helpful either for you or for rebuilding that relationship. Definitely. You know, Harry has been spending some time, or at least he did spend some time with Princess Eugenie. She came to visit him um, in February. They went out to dinner together. They went to the Super Bowl. Do you think that she may have encouraged him to make this meeting happen? So that's what's been said. They say that Princess Eugenie is a peacemaker or, or a go-between, a, a middleman of some sort, however we put it. Uh, she's obviously maintained these good relations with Harry and Meghan, visiting mm -hmm. them in California when she was out there and um, publicly being seen with them. But she's also said to be close to the Queen as well, and that would put her in a perfect position to broker that sort of meeting. Um, and whether there was a power play as well in place when the Queen then said, you have to meet your father, Prince Charles, as well, if you want to meet me, which is what's been reported and rumoured uh, or not, Eugenie may have been the person uh, to suggest the meeting either way or to try and help arrange it, make the contact. Though, of course, the royal family don't have any trouble making contact if they want to with Harry. I don't think we're at the stage where it's not answering the phone to them or anything like that, though there was that allegation from him that Prince Charles stopped really answering him at one point. Right. Um, so maybe they're not beyond that if there was any truth in that allegation. But I think that whatever the case, again, it's a family. It's a family very much in the public gaze. Mm -hmm. And there will be members of the family who help to broker meetings and reconciliations or distance than the likes of you or I might have to deal with in our families. But there's always someone in the family who's who's the peacemaker or who tries to link people back together after arguments. And, and if that's Eugenie's role, well, well, good for her for doing that. 
Yes, very interesting that maybe Princess Eugenie played Peacemaker. You know, there was a lot of why didn't William see him because he was on a ski trip with Kate. That's what, um, we, you know, we're reporting. So I don't know. Uh, a lot, it's a great first step, hopefully. Definitely. You know, I think it, it does feel like this was sort of tacked on to the beginning of their mm-hmm. Invictus trip. So I don't know that they really, you know, everyone probably already had plans before this mm-hmm. decision was made. So I wouldn't really read too much into who saw who and who missed out. Mm-hmm. No, I, I totally agree with you. It seems like this was a last minute impromptu meeting and um, yeah, we'll see. Maybe they'll be back in June. We'll have to see. <laughs> um, but they are making big news this week because of course the Invictus games are going on and um, they have been sidelined for the past few years because of COVID. It marks the first time that Harry and Meghan have taken the international stage together since leaving the Royal family. They kicked the Invictus games off, both making speeches. Um, so take a quick look at this. I tell you what, and people around the world have missed this. The boundless humility, the compassion, and the friendship that is Invictus. Yeah, it seems like Harry was getting a bit emotional, you know, when he first stood up on that stage, you know, gave Megan a kiss, which we don't usually see Royals doing any sort of PDA like that. So <laughs> totally a big deal. Um, right. But yeah, he was definitely emotional. This is, I mean, he, he's, you know founded the Invictus games. Like this is, this is kind of like his baby. So it's great to see him back, um, back in action. Yeah. This is something that he's always, this, you know, the Invictus games is really something he's been so passionate about. It's so important to him. So I think it's really, um, moving for him to be back, you know, hosting the games again, um, seeing them on this international scale, being able to be there. Um, and he has been, you know, there's been several moments that he's gotten very emotional and you can see Mm -hmm. Megan sort of, you know, either patting his knee or holding his hand and really being there to support him during, you know, such an emotional process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. And, you know, of course people are reading into everything like they always do. And (laughs) Megan made in her speech, she said the phrase, this is service. And a lot of people are like, is this a dig towards the Royal family? I don't think so. I think she's just saying that she's commending everybody that is uh, participating in the game, being there, saying like, you know, this, they represent service. I don't think that the, yeah. that was a dig towards the royal family. Exactly. I think that, you know, it's more about the the service men and women yeah. who, you know, who participate in the games, the veterans and, you know, the, the participants of the games themselves. I don't think it has anything to do with the royal family. Yeah, no. And they're attending a ton of events together. I love when they were riding around in a little cars with yeah, the land rovers so cute land rovers i love that they're attending a lot of the you know the games and it seems like it's a you know it's a great um great week of events it really is yeah it, it really is always a fun um uh, a, a fun of uh, you know events there's always something fun to look forward to there's lots of families there's lots of kids um it's really a family oriented uh program of events and i just i look forward i was look i looked forward to it every year and now i'm so glad it's back you know several years later right and it's great to see harry kind of doing interviews he was doing interviews with kids and uh you know kind of getting back out there and of course you know a lot of people have got to talk about megan's fashion i think she really i mean she always looks beautiful but she really looks beautiful with these white jump suits and you know everything like that she looks great yeah i think she does look great everything is you know really it's just so her style isn't it you know like the minimalist color palette the modern you know really trendy looks but it's always down to earth you know there's like a you know with the relaxed pairs of jeans or ballet flats you know she's doing um you know so she always does such a great job being just a little bit relatable yeah definitely all right well speaking of being relatable the royal family gathered for their annual easter service but this time it was without um queen elizabeth ii because she did not um, go to the traditional Easter mass, but Prince William, Duchess Kate, they celebrated with their eldest children, Prince George and Princess Charlotte. And it marked the first official Easter appearance for them. Very cool. They looked great, very color coordinated outfits and um, <laughs> all in their blues and pastels for Easter. <laughs> the Cambridges, the Cambridge family, they are always like family photo goals. Anytime mm-hmm. they're all together, it's exactly what you want to bring to your family photo shoot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> poor, poor, but poor Louie not getting the invite. <laughs> to, be, to be fair, I mean, I have a son Louis' age, and yeah. I can tell you, I would not bring him. Either. 
I agree. We toyed with the idea of bringing uh, my daughter who's about to turn three and my 10 month old to, to church this Easter. And I'm like, you know what? Maybe next year, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe not. Um, but I mean, we don't know, but I feel like they may have probably popped by to see the queen um, since this all took place at Windsor. So maybe they, uh, they stopped by to see her and wished her a happy Easter. Yeah. It looks like they did all stay overnight at Windsor mm-hmm. castle. Um, they were seen leaving the next day as a family. So I'm sure they did get to spend some time with her. You know, I wonder if there's not a big Easter Sunday dinner afterwards. Imagine the Easter egg hunt at oh. Windsor Castle, though, for all the kids, because all the kids were there. It must have been so much fun. And what do they put in those Easter baskets? I would love to know. I mean, oh, what do you get the royal family? I love it. Um, but notice, noticeably absent were Prince Charles and Duchess Camilla, but they don't usually spend the Easter holiday with the royal family, correct? Right. They, yeah, they are usually, they're up in Burke Hall, which is one of their country homes. They usually kind of spend that time there. Um, so it was not surprising that they weren't there, but it was a great show. I mean, almost every other member of the Royal family was at the Easter Sunday service. Um, so you, it was still a great show from the family to see everyone together going to church, celebrating Easter. I thought it was so much fun to see. Definitely. All right. Well, the Easter mass wasn't the only event that the queen did not partake in. We talked a little bit about this last week, but Prince Charles and Camilla represented the queen at the Royal Monday service, which is, of course, a pre-Easter tradition where members of the royal family distribute specially minted coins known as Monday money to recognize people over 70 years old for their service to their communities. We did speak about this last week, but um, Charles and Camilla did represent. And this was right before or before or after Harry visited uh, the Queen. So this all took place the same day. Right. I think this was also right before Charles and Camilla um, left for their country home. And it was it is such an iconic event for the queen every year. So I think it was really meaningful that it was Prince Charles, you know, um, ha- handing out the Monday money and sort of meeting with those people this year. We're definitely seeing a shift in, you know, the sovereign. And although I don't think we'll see a dramatic shift, we're just sort of seeing inklings of what the future might look like. And this was one of those times. Definitely. No, you're so true. I'm so, so right. I mean, the queen has been doing a lot more virtual appearances. I mean, she is, she's celebrating 96. A year. She's going to be 96, yes. or she, you know, so it's, so, you know, the fact that she is still doing all of these virtual meetings, it's pretty incredible. I mean, it really is. Right. right. Um, I mean, you know, she really has earned the downtime. Yeah, seriously, she? take a break. Right. <laughs> make me <laughs> tired. Um, all right. Well, now it is time to spill the royal tea. And this is interesting. Uh, Angela Kelly, who is one of the Queen's most trusted aides, personal stylist, dressmaker, she kind of does it all. Um, she updated her book, The Other Side of the Coin, The Queen, The Dresser, and The Wardrobe, to include reflections on the Queen's life amid the coronavirus pandemic. Um, she also updated about, you know, about how the queen was feeling or how she acted right after Prince Philip's um, funeral, as we know that she was, you know, had to sit alone because of COVID and it was, um, it was, it was a hard thing to see. And I'm it sure was it was so, a hard thing for her to so go through. To watch. Yeah, yeah. I think all of us collectively, our hearts just went out to her because she is such a grandmotherly figure to a lot of people. And just, it was so hard to see her sitting alone. Um, But Angela Kelly does say, you know, Angela Kelly is probably one of the women closest to the queen in the whole world. Mm -hmm. And after the funeral, she said that she sort of, she, um, you know, removed the queen's coat and her hat and the queen just silently went into her sitting room, shut the door and had you know, some quiet time to herself. And it just, it makes me emotional thinking about it. Just imagining that it's just heartbreaking. It really is. It, it really is. I, I, I couldn't imagine, you know, be spending your pretty much your entire life with somebody and then, you know, that shifts and that changes and you got to kind of learn to live without it. It's got to be oh. pretty, pretty emotional. It is yeah. very emotional. I mean, but she also had a, a, some fun updates as well. <laughs> um, this is yeah. kind of a shift. She <laughs> talked about cutting Queen Elizabeth's hair because, you know, you couldn't, have a lot of people around you had to stay with like your small circle and mm-hmm. Angela was now um hairdresser as well <laughs> hair cutter <laughs> I love that story yeah so I guess they kept a really close bubble around the queen to protect her and keep her healthy Angela Kelly was one of those people but the hairdresser was not so Angela Kelly was responsible for cutting the queen's hair and sort of keeping her hair trimmed and she said that it was terrifying which I imagine it was <laughs> I mean I just I can't imagine that's not a, a job where you can kind of you know oops I made a mistake <laughs> right? 
to know. You have to, I'd be like shaking and sweating, right. which I'm sure she probably was, but um, she looked great through all of her Zooms over yeah. the COVID. So Angela did a good job. I wonder if that's now <laughs> another full-time job that she has. Right. I would love to uh, know. Um, this is interesting. So Prince Charles may choose to drop his name when he becomes king instead opting for one of his middle names. Now, according to Royal Protocol, monarchs are allowed to choose any of their middle names as their royal moniker. The queen's eldest son has three middle names, Philip, Arthur, or George. So he could pick one of these for his reigning name. I wonder if he will actually do this. I mean, he's so known as Prince Charles. I, I, I right. wonder if he would kind of do it, but it has been done before. Right. Definitely. You know, um, the queen's own father changed his name. He became King George the sixth after his father. Um, although he was, um, Prince Albert, you know, his whole life growing up and even his brother was called David and decided to have the, you know, he became King Edward the seventh. Um, and so it's definitely been done before. It's very commonplace. Um, but I think the queen, queen Elizabeth said, well, this is my name. Mm -hmm. And I think that Prince Charles kind of has that practicality, especially as he is as old as he is, he's probably going to say, you know, this is my name. It's been my name for the last 70 plus years. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, at its heart, the practice is done because they're really taking on a new role, almost becoming a new person as the sovereign. Um, so historically it's very interesting, but I don't think we'll see Charles, you know, taking that on. Yeah, I don't think so either. But interesting that that's right. <laughs> interesting that it could happen. Who knows? Yes, very. All right. Well, now it is time to break down the royal rules. And as Queen Elizabeth celebrates her 96th birthday, we decided to take a look back at some of her most iconic looks with Bethan Holt. She is the author of the brand new book, The Queen: 70 Years of Majestic Style. Take a look. Um, I know this is going to be hard, but how would you describe her style? Is, are there sort of key points or key, you know, habits that she's kept the whole time? Yeah, I think one thing that was really interesting that I came to realize um, when I was writing the book, that actually so many of the things that we know and love about the Queen's style literally go back to what she was taught by her grandmother and her mother when she was a teenager. So the idea of never leaving the house as a lady without wearing a hat, mm -hmm. you know, that is something that was very much um, a custom in the kind of 1940s, 1950s. Um, the idea of having this like very neat hand bag that you could keep everything in and very ladylike again that is very much a style of that kind of 40s 50s time period um so she has all these things that we see as her style signatures um even wearing gloves as well you know she's so meticulous about wearing gloves that's again a, a very much a thing that it was kind of a custom um, around the time that she was very young. So it's amazing to think that she has kept all these things um, as the kind of anchors of her style. And yet she has changed with the times as well. And she has updated her look. She hasn't been a kind of a slave to the trends. You don't see her kind of copying what's on the catwalks. If anything, you see the catwalks copying her, which is just a testament to how iconic her style has become, I think. I heard somewhere that a stylist said that you don't dress the queen the queen dresses herself does she you know does she know exactly what she wants to be wearing you know was a lot of it dictated by her own sort of you know compass of what's fashionable yeah, I think she definitely knew her own boundaries. Um, I actually think as well that Prince Philip had a huge amount of influence on his wife's look. Um, there's stories of him kind of suggesting designers to her because he's seen other women wearing them that, and he thinks that those women look good. Um, there's also stories of him kind of helping her get back into shape after she had her children and like showing her the exercises to do. And um, if she didn't like a hat or something, she would tell milliners rather than say, I don't like it. She would say, oh, Philip didn't like it. And that's why she didn't wear it. Um, so, yeah, she definitely had I think she had very strong opinions herself. And she had very close people around her who were kind of advising her as well. Um, so, so yeah, I think all those influences came together. I don't think anyone was ever going to kind of tell her what to do, you know? Definitely. I mean, how would you say that her style evolved like over the decades? Did she always keep up with the trends and was she ever criticized for her style along the way? Yeah. So I think this is really clever and actually so many of us women can kind of learn a lesson from the queen on this because she doesn't kind of, 
go into every trend, you know, and like fully adopt it. But actually when she was younger in the 1950s, all those beautiful kind of knit waist, big skirted dresses, she was a real kind of um, poster woman for that. And now, even if you think back to the 1950s, she is like quintessential, the 1950s look, it's so romantic. Um, Her look really then changed in the 60s as all women's fashion did, you know, it got a lot more simple, a lot bolder. The shirt, the skirts got a little bit shorter. Hers never went that short, (laughs) the mini skirt trend. Um, But, you know, she definitely kind of moved with the times. And, you know, when women started wearing more trousers, she did a little bit of that as well, more in her personal life than kind of um, out and about as the queen. Well, come June, all eyes are going to be on her for the Platinum Jubilee. I mean, do you have any predictions predictions of what color she might wear, um, you know, w- any predictions on that? Because like I said, all eyes are going to be on her. <laughs> well, platinum. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, but I also just think that we will see her wearing really something very unexpected. Um, I think that is what her dresser, Angela Kelly, is so good at now, is creating these surprises. You know, I remember her 90th birthday when she was wearing this lime green outfit. You know, you would never have expected that. Um, But, you know, the pictures just went viral because she just, she looked incredible and only the queen could get away with that. Mm -hmm. They've been using a lot of purple as the kind of colors of this, a jubilee as well so I think we could definitely see some of that but it will definitely be a look that has a lot of thought that's gone into it a lot of symbolism and is um is something that only the queen could wear I love the the bright neons that she's really embraced in her older age. I think when she was younger, she wore bright colors, but not as bright as, like you said, that electric green. Um, why do you think she's really turned to those really electric neon colors? Well, I think she's just really, you know, hitting home the message that, you know, she is a unique woman in a unique position. She even more unique now because she has been in that position for such a long time. She's got into her nineties doing this. And I think she's really unafraid to be, um, you know, taking a real, um, uh, to to be, you know, taking really bold decisions with what she's wearing. Um, And and I think that just shows it, you know, she stood out from the crowd like nothing else. Um, And, you know, the queen really has, you know, every kind of right to do that. Um, And I think it also is a really nice message about, about women. And, you know, there's, there's so often been this idea that as women get older, that we should be hidden away or, you know, that we're not worth like looking at anymore, but, you know, she's only become more and more iconic as she's got older, which I think is an amazing message for, for all women really. And one for us all to kind of be inspired by. What do you think has been her biggest fashion statement? Oh my gosh. Um, (laughs) um, Yeah, there have been, I mean, I do think to go back to that 90th birthday one again, not to sound like a broken record, there was also another bright green outfit um, around the same time as that, as that, which I thought was really poignant. It was on the one year anniversary of um, the Grenfell Tower disaster, which was Um, In the UK, there was this really terrible fire um, where many people were killed um, in London. And on the one year anniversary of that happening, she wore um, a green outfit and green had become the kind of color of the survivors and of the campaign around that. Um, And I thought that was a really beautiful gesture from her of kind of showing her support for that, um, for that moment and, you know, showing that she was kind of thinking of those people in that moment. Um, So I think it can be a very, um, a very touching thing as well, that the way that she, that she uses color. Mm -hmm. Um, But even going back um, 
to the kind of statement looks that she wore in the 1950s. There was this amazing kind of black and white tuxedo dress that everyone kind of ran to copy the next day because they just loved it so much. So, you know, we might not remember some of those fashion statements, but um, they, they're truly amazing as well. Yeah. And then before we wrap up, I mean, how would you say the queen has influenced style from a newer generation of royals? And do you consider the queen a fashion icon? Um, okay, so for the new generation, I think they're very conscious of the Queen's legacy. And I think actually so many of the things that we see the Duchess of Cambridge doing today are things that she's learnt from the Queen, you know, um, the way of using colour, of using different symbols to send messages um, I think a lot of um, Kate's love of skirts as well came from the Queen because famously, uh, apparently the Queen isn't keen on um, women wearing trousers so much. Obviously, Kate has kind of um, veered away from that more recently. Um, but I, th I think she'll have taken a lot of tips from the Queen. So for sure, she will have... Um, yeah, being inspired by her. And, and absolutely, I think the Queen is a fashion icon. I think, you know, she may not be wearing... Um, you know, designer looks the whole time. But actually what she is, is an example of someone who has crafted a look that is entirely her own. You can recognize her from a mile off. You know, she doesn't look like anyone else. She does her own thing. She sticks to it and she looks amazing while she's doing it. And that is definitely the, the definition of a fashion icon. So yeah, she gets my vote. <laughs> ours too well Bethan thank you so much we really appreciate you taking the time and make sure everybody gets the queen 70 years of majestic style it is a great read and uh it's absolutely beautiful so thank you so much thank you so much for having me such a great book you guys should definitely pick it up if you haven't already it is on sale right now um it's a, not only uh interesting but it's beautiful to look at as well <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful it's a, such a lovely um lovely book and i love books like that for sort of your coffee table and yes always fun to look through <laughs> definitely all right well now it's time to check in on our pint size palace and prince harry made some mentions of his kids archie and lily during his invictus speech he said that he wants his kids to grow up in a better world to grow up in a fairer world a safer world and a more equal world and he also gave a little insight into what archie wants to do when he grows up take a look when I talk to my son, Archie, about what he wants to be when he grows up, some days it's an astronaut, other days it's a pilot. A helicopter pilot, obviously. <laughs> or quasi, from Octonauts. If you're laughing, then you've seen it. But what I remind him is that no matter what you want to be when you grow up, it's your character that matters most. Like most uh, three-year-olds always changing their minds. <laughs> right? <laughs> it sounds familiar. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's like Louis being, you know, a little bit crazy. We all, we, we, it's so relatable. <laughs> so relatable. But yeah, I love, you know, we always say this on these royal tours or these royal events, we always get a little insight into what the home life is like. And, you know, it turns out, you know, they're just like us. They're real people just right. like us. <laughs> Especially with the kids. It's nice to know that even princes and princesses. <laughs> yes, exactly. Princes and princesses wants to be astronauts, doctors, just like the rest of us. Yeah. Um, but I love it. Lots, um, lots of great Invictus content and a lot of, uh, it's nice to see Harry and Meghan kind of out in a battle again. It is. It's really nice to see them, you know, doing important work again. Definitely. Well, Christine, thank you so much for running down all things Royals with me as always. Thank you so much. Another busy, but fun week. Very, very busy. All right, guys, keep commenting, keep subscribing, and we will see you all next week.